Welcome to the Hockey Writers Blackhawks Banter, a weekly show with our top Chicago Blackhawks writing crew, bringing you the latest news, rumors, trades, player grades, game results, and much more. From training camp to the playoffs, from Chelsea Dagger to the Madhouse on Madison, our team covers everything that happens with the Hawks. So get comfortable, grab a beverage, it's time for some Blackhawks Banter. Blackhawks Banter. Welcome to episode 44 of Blackhawks Banter, presented by thehockeywriters.com, where you can find a full lineup of shows just like ours. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, find us on your preferred podcast network, and follow along across social media. My name is Sean Filippelli, and ran, rounding out our panel tonight is Greg Boyson, Brooke Laferno, and Gail Kochuk. Well, we finally have some hockey to talk about, so let's get right into it. This past weekend was the Tom Gerfer's Prospect Showcase, in which the Blackhawks prospect fate, prospects excuse me, faced off against the Minnesota Wild rookies. Unfortunately, the Hawks' side lost both games in back-to-back sets, but they were close battles. They lost the first one 3-2 to two, and the second one 4-3. to three. And it got me thinking, how much stake do you guys put into this kind of a preseason exhibition prospect-type showcase? Do you think it really matters? Does it set the stage for what's to come? How much value do you think we should really put into their results? Greg? Well, like the results, they lost. I mean, that's nothing. Um, I don't think, to be honest with you, I'm surprised they keep score at these things. Um, but, you know, it, it they're, you know, the, 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 the roster that the Hawks uh, took up to Minnesota with them was essentially like training camp for the Ice Hawks because there's a lot of guys uh, that took part in those two games that are going to be big-time contributors in Rockford this season. So it's always good to kind of get to see those guys – get as much work in as they can. And, you know, you could lay a foundation. You take, you take these games with a grain of salt, because again, it's young players versus young players, obviously not the type of competition they're going to see necessarily in the AHL. Definitely not if they get to the NHL, but it's also good to get some footing, solid footing. And, and Lucas Reichel did exactly that. He went up there and had a really big weekend. Uh, just looked like, the best player on the ice of both teams uh, was performed well in all three zones, um, set up scoring plays. It's exactly what you wanted to see like him. He definitely stood out head and shoulders was the best player of the two games off of both teams. And that's good to see. You hopefully can carry that momentum in the training camp, but everybody kind of looked like a prospect except him. He looked like an NHL player in a little bit. I was able to catch um, and, you, and you had a guy like uh, Andre Altibarmaki, and that's a name we're all going to have to learn how to pronounce because he is going to be an NHL player. I, I loved his game last year in Rockford. He uh, progressed well, and he made some great individual plays. Uh, there's a clip of his goal that's been floating around on Twitter. You can look it up and uh, check it out for yourself. Uh, kid, just nothing. He's just gritty and, and got some talent. I mean, he's going to be that pesky bottom six player with a little bit of talent. Um, and you had some guys like uh, Alex uh, Regula and uh, Wyatt Kalnick and um, Evan Barrett, who are guys who are fringe players, guys that could challenge for NHL spots this year. And they all looked, uh, had good showings over the weekend. So you just kind of look at uh, specific players in these type of things, not a whole team effort. You, you look for guys that you're, you're hoping to do well, and those guys, they did. And uh, hopefully that carries over. They'll get, some, they'll get some looks at training camp here with the, with the Hawks before heading to Rockford. And um, it's always good to get your season off on the right foot. And despite two losses, so to speak, uh, I think that was accomplished. Yeah, well said. And I mean, uh, you know, as far as the players that we needed to show up, we've been hyping Reichel this entire offseason. So certainly nice to see him on the highlight reel there. Uh, Gail, do these do these games matter or are they just exhibitions getting ready for the season? No, yeah, I don't think that they really matter. It's just a matter of obviously the players getting into their groove and having a chance to play and, and get ready for uh, hopefully, you know, seasons to come. Um, Lucas Reichel again, uh, I think that the Blackhawks brass is pretty happy with what they saw. And I think everybody's pretty excited as to whether he can, you know, transfer that over to training camp with, uh, you know, more real NHL, NHL players. Um, so that's, that's, that's exciting. And let's face it, you know, 
I think what was it uh, the second game even went to overtime and they only lost by one goal. I know that the, like I just said, it didn't matter, but right. They were still close games. So um, I'm sure that they had fun and um, it was a good start. And I'm just excited that we get to talk about people playing hockey. It's, it's here. Yeah, I, I agree. Nice to actually talk about some uh, real on ice activity. Brooke, does the fact that the Hawks lost back to back against rival Minnesota bother you or just another game to move on past? I don't think it matters like statistically or whatever, but it kind of matters. I do think because we keep talking about how the Blackhawks like prospect pool is really not good at all. And they're kind of, it's not going to affect us right now, but it will in the next two to three years, maybe. Um, And I think that kind of shows with these kind of tournaments because losing in the way that they did kind of, I think also kind of emulates what the Blackhawks have been good enough to hang, not good enough to win kind of thing. So I do think it matters in that respect. Like it kind of shows that the Hawks need some talent. And like I said, it's not going to affect them this year, this upcoming season, but it will start to affect them eventually. And I think that kind of highlights how much depth they need. Yeah. Interesting point about uh, them being such close games that they couldn't hang on to kind of the story of their, uh, 2020-21 season. Um, for me, all bias aside, you know, I want to say that in short, no, these games don't really matter. Uh, not just because our Blackhawks lost, but the reality is the way I break it down, if you're on the winning side, then I think it builds momentum and it helps motivate that side and that crew to just continue on that path. But if you're on the losing side, like Chicago was, really it, what, what you should look at it as is an opportunity to learn and progress and see where your shortcomings were. So it's still literally preseason exhibition, you know, to call it um, at, at the heights of what we can even call these games, like, like Greg alluded to. So really what this was, was a showcase of what's in their system, what they can do, how they can work together and, and guys trying to make a name for themselves. And like uh, you folks have already mentioned, the names that needed to make a name for themselves, the, the Reichels, the Kalinucks, the Regulus, they did. So that's promising in my mind. The score, who cares? But the fact is the players that we needed to show up did, and that just puts them uh, on our radar for hoping to break into the lineup, which is where we want to see them. Speaking of the lineup and speaking of training as we head into the season, uh, let's take a look and and talk a little bit about a story that Gail wrote recently. And what she did is she broke down five main storylines that we should all as fans be paying very close attention to throughout the team's training camp. One of those such stories was a a very intriguing one that I wanted to go around the table and get your thoughts on. And it involves the veterans and those that might be on the fringe and who may or may not actually fit into their lineup. Some pretty key names on that list as well. So what I want to do with each of us having an athlete assigned to us, I want to go around the table here and see if we can make a case for why our specific athlete should make it in above the rest. Gail, we'll start with you with Ryan Carpenter. Okay. Um, I have always been a big fan of Carpy. I love his nickname, Carpy. Um, and I think that he would be the ideal candidate to kind of anchor the fourth line um, at, at center. Um, he played wing on the fourth line most of last season. Um, but I, it, I think that that was, that was primarily because David Camp was better at winning face-offs than him. Um, so Camp played center. We all know that, that Camp is with the Toronto Maple Leafs now. Um, so Carpenter has a career uh, success rate at the data, 47.4. It's a decent number. Um, I feel like him and newcomer uh, Juhar Kara, we're all going to have to learn how to say that, right? Um, can maybe share the face-off duties because one is a right-handed tendency and one's left-handed tendency. Um, so they are both physical players um, I, and, and, I, and, and gritty, and that's the kind of style that you need with the fourth line. Um, Carpenter brings, brings that veteran presence. He brings experience. Um, and he also is only signed for a really reasonable million dollar cap hit. So I just think that he's the ideal depth player to complement that lineup. And, and I think that he'll, um, I hope he has a chance to do that. Well said. I, I like Harvey too. He, he really shows a lot of character out there. And uh, he's a fun guy to follow. Brooke, why should Adam Gaudet make it above Ryan Carpenter? Ugh. I wanted to keep this short and sweet and just say he should make the roster just because he brings a nice skill set. We didn't really get to see much of him after he was acquired. He only played in seven games, but in seven games, he had four points and he was on the top line as well, too. I don't think he will be on the top line if he makes the team anymore because of how the team made changes. And that's totally okay. but you can't have enough skilled players on the roster. I think he's not one that's going to 
like really come out and be big and flashy, but he's a nice depth player. And like I said, the Hawks have been needing something like that. And I, I think he's a nice compliment to the team right now, if he can make it. Yeah. And that chip on his shoulder from coming over from Vancouver certainly helps. So we'll see if he can carry that into next season and what he can do with it. Uh, speaking of people who should have chips on their shoulder, Greg, why should Dylan Strome be in the opening night lineup? Well, I mean, we've talked a lot about him this off season about, we all kind of, I don't know, expected him to be traded or wanted to be traded. Just felt that he didn't have a, a spot here anymore. Uh, but he still could be a very valuable piece to this team. I mean, um, we were all excited about him when, when the Hawks first acquired him. Uh, they rounded out that first season with the Hawks. He had 51 points in 58 games. And it was like, wow, this kid finally figured it out. He looks like the number three overall pick. And that guy hasn't really been here on a consistent basis since then he's dealt with some injuries he's dealt with inconsistent plays we've talked ad nauseum about how he seems to only play well when he's with Alex DeBrinkett um so just playing with Alex DeBrinkett is how I see that solution but um you know he's still valuable the Hawks are going to need to they're going to need some five on five depth and scoring that was their biggest problem last year I foresee that being another issue this year uh, he definitely still has the ta the talent to produce. Um, it's just a matter of figuring it out. Um, he's got versatility. We know he can put the center. We know he can play the wing. And you need that on this team because we have, you know, 86 centers going in the training camp and like one real right winger. So, you know, being versatile is going to get you in the lineup. And, you know, he can contribute on the power play as well. And the Hawks need to figure out a way to get a second power play unit going this year. Last year, it was the, the power play was great for the first half of the season. And then it disappeared when it became the let's all stand around and watch Patrick Kane show, which never works. So they, they need to do something to get two functioning power play units. And Dylan Strong could definitely be a guy that could be one of the main contributors on that second power play unit, unless you want to throw him in a top one with, you know, to bring it and Kane who have chemistry. So, um, you know, he definitely still deserves a spot, uh, regardless of how down we all seem to be on him. Uh, maybe he'll prove us all wrong this year, or maybe his struggles will continue and he won't make it into the lineup like he did at the end of the last season. But uh, there's definitely a place for that Dylan Strom that we first got. If he, that Dylan Strom shows up in training camp, then uh, we'll stop talking about trading him. I would agree with that, and I would uh, commit to that as well. But like you said, we'll see. Uh, you know, Str Strom should definitely be considered the most skilled of the list that we're talking about here. And, and right behind him is Alex Nylander, former eighth overall pick, who still hasn't been able to impress in Chicago, let alone in his short stint in Buffalo. Um, I I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that he needs to be in this opening light lineup because not only does he need to be itching to get back in and prove his value, but the Blackhawks need to create a path for him to do that. I mean, they're looking to turn the corner. They're looking to compete. And Nylander is a, a kid who has the skill. He just hasn't shown it. So if they can provide him with an opportunity to have a redemption year of sorts um, where, he, you know, he's coming back and he just signed on a, essentially the most proven of deals you can sign with, a, you know, a minimum minimum financial commitment for one year. Now's his chance. Like, this is his only chance. The reality is his entire career could be on the line. And I don't think that's an overstatement because what he can do in his return from injury from missing all of last year is going to really show what he's able to do as a pro. So it's the Chicago's benefit to make sure that Nylander's in there so that he has the chance to prove it or not. And, and that's who I'm going to go with. So of, of that list, I'm, I'm going to stick with Nylander and say that I want to see him in there because I really want to see what he can do. And I hope he proves us all wrong, similar to what Greg is hoping Strom can do. I like that uh, kind of term, prove it or not. That seems like that should be the mantra for most of them. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of proving it, let's talk a little bit about the NHL awards. Although we're uh, a season away from them, Brooke did a write-up on who of this Blackhawks lineup might be lifting some of that hardware by year's end. Uh, she touched on Jones potentially winning Norris, Debrinket capturing the Rocket, and Kane the Lady Bing. It got me thinking, are there any other... Blackhawks personnel who might be able to reach that level of achievement and in doing so what would they actually have to do to get there Brooke we'll start with you assuming that Reichel does crack this lineup what does he need to do to capture the Calder trophy uh, my first though was he needs to score a lot of goals he also needs to lead in points and if you look at the current winner 
um, of the Calder, the Kirill Kaprizov from Minnesota. Um, he led all rookies in points um, and goals. And he also needs to be good defensively. Most of the Calder winners are always on the plus side, plus 10, whatever it is. So I think he needs to kind of prove himself on both ends of the ice. And you know, something that kind of intrigues me about Reichel is he's not one that sticks out to me as someone that could win the Calder. Realistically, I don't know if that will be the case yet. But then you look at, like I said, Kaprizov, and he was a fifth round pick. I don't think anyone expected him to. So that kind of adds another interesting element. So I think if he wants to win the Calder, just light the lamp, play good defensively, get a lot of points, and you're in a good spot to do that. Yeah, definitely get on the score sheet is a recipe for success for, for any kind of rookie campaign that wants to be in that discussion. And I mean, you saw last year that Pia Suter, even through his streaky, streaky production, excuse me, was right up there uh, with the NHL leaders all season. And to me, I think Reichel would have a little bit more of a consistent streak to him. So I'm mm-hmm. curious to see once he breaks the lineup, if he can maintain that kind of play. Mm-hmm. Uh, shouldn't surprise anybody, but uh, let's go straight to Greg and talk about what Jeremy Colleton needs to do to win the Jack Adams. Greg, take it away. I'm starting to sense a theme here that you guys like watching my blood pressure rise by asking me all the Jeremy Colleton questions, but uh, um, how can Jeremy Colleton win the Jack Adams award? Well, if all other 31 NHL coaches spontaneously combust the morning of the NHL award show, then I think they have to give it to him. Otherwise than that, there's no freaking way. Sorry, not happening. Um, and, I, and personally, Jeremy Carlton shouldn't be worried about winning the Jack Adams Award. I don't think any coach goes into the season as a, as a goal, as that being a goal. But he needs to worry about having a job at the end of the season because the pressure is on this year. And it doesn't – he needs to perform, not be the best team, best coach. He just needs to be uh, a playoff team. We discussed it last week. This roster, Stan Bowman, built this roster like a man whose job depends on some playoff success this year. And Jeremy Colleton coach teams have been known for some slow starts. And if that happens again this year with this roster, which is the best he's ever had since being here, um, then he he could be in the hot seat pretty quickly. So um, I even if the Blackhawks make the playoffs, which should be a goal and should be achievable based on the team they have. They've got a Hall of Fame goalie. They've improved the defense. By all signs are showing that their captain is coming back and in good shape. And you've got a healthy Kirby Doc. There's no more excuses. The Jeremy Carlton excuse machine should be blown up and shot into the center of the sun. There's no more excuses. It's put up or shut up time. And hey, if he gets them to a division championship, you know, they win the central then maybe you can consider him. I don't see that happening with Colorado being in the division, but realistically something like that would have to happen for him to do it. So that's why it's not going to happen, but uh, you know, we'll see stranger things have happened. Maybe, you know, I'd throw a spinal tap reference out there, but I don't think most of our listeners nor rest of my crew here would too young for that. So no Jag Adams for, for Carlton, but that answer shouldn't surprise you. Didn't he get wow. some votes though last year or last season? Didn't he get like one or two? I don't know votes? if he got votes, but I know when the Hawks, when the power play was carrying that team, they people were saying, hey, he should be in consideration. Yeah. And uh, those those people were high. Yeah, and you were like, no, thanks. Yeah, pe- those were people who basically just looked at the record and didn't yeah. watch the games and thought, hey, the Hawks are doing better than we thought. It must be because of good coaching. No, it was right. kind of in spite of coaching. Well, on that note, if we haven't made it super clear already, I asked a question about what Carlton needs to do to win an award, and Greg was busy writing up his termination papers. So that that's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to a more optimistic storyline, and I want to position this one to you, Gail. Could you see a scenario where if Captain Jonathan Taves does return, he could be voted worthy of the Masterton Trophy? Okay, well, before I start that, I just want to say I'm probably the most positive about Colleton, and I don't even think I could make a case for him getting the Jack <laughs> Adams. So, uh, but yeah, we had, we had some fun with Greg there. Um, okay, yes. Taves, you bet, you bet. I think if he comes back and if he can have a strong season, um, he could easily be considered for the Masters. And um, uh, the definition of the award is the best exemplifies the qualities of perseverance, sportsmanship, and dedication to ice hockey. Obviously, he had to persevere. He missed all of last season with uh, symptoms from chronic immune 
response syndrome. Um, it must have been incredibly difficult to not play, to not understand what was wrong with him, to not understand when he was going to get better, to, to just not know. Um, but but he stuck with it, and he's been working hard. All signs point towards him being ready to start the season. And just before we came on, I read Mark Lazarus of The Athletic um, was talking about how he, he a number of different sources that he's, he's talked to have said that uh, Taze looks strong, Taze looks good, he looks ready to go. Um, so if he could come back and return with any form of, you know, semblance of his former self, who knows if he'll be able to play all those heavy minutes or, you know, if he's going to be uh, sheltered a little bit, but either way um, it's going to be a success story for sure. If he can come back and if he can make an impact to the team, um, you know, and he's, he's obviously going to come back as the captain and, and somebody that's going to pick up right where he left off as a leader, on and off the ice as he strives to, to get his, himself and his team to the playoffs. So um, I think that that'll even further demonstrate sportsmanship and dedication to hockey. So absolutely, he could be a candidate uh, for sure. Yeah, it's been great to see that positive feedback in terms of what uh, what everyone's seeing out of him uh, prior to the season starting. And to me, I mean, I think it's a no-brainer. If he makes it into the lineup uh, and plays any amount of games throughout this year, let alone throughout the season, he has to be Chicago's nominee for that award. So um, let alone a front runner throughout the league, given what we're now being uh, made aware of that he went through and, and if he can climb back from that. And again, like you said, be impactful. So it uh, seems to be a no brainer that it, that it might be his to win in that respect, but we'll see. And hopefully he is healthy and can provide for the team. Uh, you know, shocking, obviously I want to talk about goalies and, and when you get a, a future hall of famer and the former Vesna winner, it sort of made me think, what does Flurry have to do to repeat as a back-to-back Vesna winner? You know, that's a tough feat to win in the, best case scenario and in, in the best of all situations uh, if you're on a contending team like the Tampa Bay Lightning for example uh, you know Fleury's joining a Blackhawks team that certainly has made a lot of off-season moves and had a lot of activity to suggest that they are going to try to contend and become more competitive but we have to see how that all aligns to me the only way that Flurry can be in that conversation next year is if he essentially repeats what he did last year if not even more so the problem is going to be that Vegas was already positioned to compete and Chicago isn't yet. But with bringing in a future Hall of Famer, you expect those types of performances. So if Fleury can win three out of four of his games, stop nine or more out of every 10 shots, let in a couple goals a game and get some shutouts along the way, I don't see why he shouldn't be considered, especially because he will be doing that on a Blackhawks team that is not in the same position that Vegas was. So to me, if he can come in and sort of lift that, uh, wait and, and lift them on his back and bring them into any kind of contention, then he has to be considered. Because even if the Hawks can't do it as much as the Golden Knights did last year, uh, you know, anything that they do is essentially going to be thanks to players like Flurry for helping them improve in that respect. So if he can come in and perform the way he did last year, then he has to be considered. That could be a heart trophy too, to be okay. honest with you. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. Absolutely. Friendly Mitchell reminders to subscribe to never miss a show, be sure to connect with all of us across social media. Our names are below us in our little screens here, and we have our own official show Twitter profile at THW Blackhawks. Feel free to interact with each of us individual, individually, excuse me, and with our show. You can also feel find free to all- ask Greg <laughs> more Coach Colleton stuff. Feel free to do that. Only you ask Greg Coach Colleton stuff. You can ask, but I, I think you know the answers you're going to get. Block, you're not going to get an answer. <laughs> You can also find all of our latest Blackhawks content at thehockeywriters.com. Speaking of Greg, let's put it into a better gear here and talk something he likes to talk about, which is Blackhawks history. In a recent article, Greg took us back to one of the best rookie seasons throughout the league, matching players like Gretzky, Solani, Ovechkin, with Tony Esposito's impressive 1969-1970 rookie campaign. Four other Hawks since have captured the Calder, so I want to go around the table and talk about why our rookie was the most impressive of the bunch. Greg, Steve Larmer. Uh, I'm actually happy you gave me Steve Larmer because he's one of my favorite uh, Hawks of all time. Um, you know, I, he was just a, a fantastic player. You know, when I was growing up, that was kind of his heyday. Um, you know, 82, 83 was his caller season. And, you know, he was just, he fit right in and he became a star right from the get go. I mean, you can just look at his 
line, and it, it was uh, 43 goals and 90 points in 80 games in his rookie season. Um, but considering that the Hawks got him in the sixth round in the 1980 draft, 120th overall, I mean, he's one of their best uh, draft picks in the history of the team. I, I, in fact, also recently did a revisit of that 1980 draft class. Uh, you could check on the hockeywriters.com. And that was the draft they got Dennis Savard, Troy Murray, and Steve Larmer in the same draft. So uh, pretty good year that year. But Larmer, you know, he he – he was just more than just the, you know, the 40 goals or the 43 goals. He was, he be, immediately became a weapon on the power play. He had 13 goals and 33 points on the power play that season as a rookie. Um, he had nine game winning goals to lead the team. That's as many as Wayne Gretzky scored that year. And he scored like 3000 goals that season. So he had, so, I mean, he's up there with the best of the best that year. Um, and it just started the career of Larmer here in Chicago. That was just based on, consistent consistency you literally counted on him to be there every night in his 11 seasons with the Blackhawks he didn't miss a single game he played in 891 straight games for the Blackhawks and to do that in the 80s and early 90s in the old Norris division that shows you that he was one tough SOB I mean there was no doubt about it uh those guys I mean you think hockey's tough now back in the, those days it was like the movie slap shot on some nights and he came out uh and didn't miss a game so that was that's the one of the most impressive things about Larmer it all started with that uh 81 80 or sorry, 82 83 season uh one of the best if not the best rookie season uh by any Blackhawk yeah, great rookie season, great athlete. And, you know, we can all agree on this panel that Lemmer still to this day doesn't get the credit he should for what he did as a Blackhawk. He needs to be in the Hall of Fame. I have no idea why he's not in the Hall of Fame. And put number 28 up in the rafters, too. Mm -hmm. Nobody should wear it. Agreed with both. Yes. Gail, that's tough to follow, but why was Panarin's rookie season any better than Lemmer's? Uh, okay, Panarin. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. I, uh, I actually kind of thought that Panarin was so good his first two seasons because he was on a liner with Patrick Kane. Um, but then he went to the Columbus Blue Jackets and his stats and his numbers rose. And then he moved on to the New York Rangers and his numbers are continuing to rise. So um, obviously he's an elite talent of his own accord. Um, and it all started in that first season with Blackhawks. He scored 30 goals and collected 77 points. So um, and let's also not forget that uh, that was the same season that Kane had 46 goals and 106 points to get the Art Ross trophy. Um, so let's face it, Panarin helped Kane and Kane helped Panarin. Uh, so I guess we really should just consider ourselves fortunate that we were able to see those two work their magic for as long as they did. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, um, but it was fun while it lasted. Yeah, it certainly was. And I mean, that's a pair that, that I still miss, and I don't know when I'm going to stop missing. Uh, and speaking of that pair, Brooke, we know Patrick Kane has become one of the best in the league, and he will be go, go down as one of the best of all time. But why was his rookie season better than the rest? Uh, I get emotional when you guys bring up Kane and Panarin in the same sentence. Very emotional. Um, but no, I when I was looking at his rookie season, the first thing I saw was 72 points um, in 82 games. As a rookie, that's pretty dang good. That's very hard to do in this league, and especially as a rookie. And I was like, that's the Patrick Kane we know. And what that's what he's continued to be. I mean, you kind of saw those numbers continue to rise and rise and rise. And honestly, last year was kind of, um, a, kind of a bad one for him in the scoring department. But that kind of shows what the talent he had. As a number one overall pick, you should be in the Calder. Um, conversation and he definitely exceeded all expectations when he came out and that was the turning point for this team the second he hit the ice and I know he was the first Blackhawk to win the Calder since Ed Belfour in 1991 and that's a pretty good feat too I mean there's so much impressiveness you can say about Kane but there was no one that deserves an award like that more than him honestly yeah I mean fair enough what he's done with his career since is, is certainly uh blowing any of the rest of this list out of the water but uh, to me, I, I, you know, when you're going to look at a season that's going to compare with what Esposito was able to do through his, I go straight to that Belfour season you just spoke about in 1991. Uh, you know, he epitomized that Belfour did what it meant to be a Blackhawk, his passion and his will to win, uh, his anger and his frustration. I mean, if there was not a better Chicago Blackhawk goalie, you know, I, I don't know who we could name in that respect. 
the fact that his impact stretched beyond just being a good rookie and was recognized across the league as one of the best among his veteran counterparts to me is what makes his rookie season one of the best of this list, if not the best of this list. Not just, excuse me, not only did he win the Calder, he won the Vesna, he won the Jennings, he made an all-star appearance, and he was even voted to the NHL's all-rookie team. That really is a rookie season that epitomizes what Belfort was able to do moving forward because it didn't just stop there. He continued to get better, and he led the, that early 90s Blackhawks team to a lot of success that they wouldn't have otherwise had without him. So to me, when you, when you want to look at one of the most important positions on a roster, obviously it's going to sound biased, but you, you have to look at goaltending. It does make or break. You can have good goaltending and kind of just skate on by, so to speak. But when you have outstanding goaltending like the Espositos, like the Belfors, it matters. So in Belfour's rookie season, what he did really mattered to the squad and mattered to the trajectory of that franchise while he was there. We had such good rookies, man. <laughs> Let's hope we can continue that this season. You know, yeah. we've had two back-to-back yeah. losses against yeah. the <laughs> Speaking of watching rookies and seeing what this team can do, I took it upon myself to write a list and comb through the entire Chicago Blackhawks 2021-22 schedule to figure out which were the 10 must-see games, in my opinion, so that fans didn't have to figure it out for themselves. I know that there might be some who are sort of on the fence about what this team can do or will do, given their lack of results of late, so I just figured, let me pencil in the 10 that I think you should watch that are really make or break this season. That got me thinking about what the rest of you think are some must-watch games throughout the season. Gail, what's yours and why? Okay, so uh, my most anticipated game um, is March 3rd, uh, Blackhawks against the Edmonton Oilers. Um, and you know, it's because Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisel are going to be at the United Center. Yeah, whatever. Um, okay, let's face it. All Blackhawks fans are going to be watching that night because it's the first time that Duncan Keith is going to be back at the United Center back in Chicago. First time since he was traded, he's going to be wearing an Oilers sweater instead of a Blackhawks sweater. And it's going to be really, really bittersweet for sure, but it's going to be pretty awesome too. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be an awesome tribute and we're all going to cry. Um, and speaking of which, the other reason is that that is actually the same night as Nicholas Jomerson's legacy night. Um, so that's going to be awesome to see Jomerson in person, watch him do his lap around the ice. Um, and it's kind of cool that, that Keith, his, his teammate, is going to be there to see that happen. I, I, I'm surprised that they actually didn't... Uh, set it up so that Keith would be there when Seabrook had his night, but whatever, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, make the rules here. So uh, uh, anyway, either way, it's going to be a really special night and uh, I just might have to find my way to that game. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's going to be a special night and watch Keith log 26 minutes of ice time that night and just show the entire Blackhawks roster that he can still outwork all of them. Yes. Yeah. We'll let him play like 30 minutes, right? Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> Brooke, what game are you looking forward to most this season and why? I said October 21st versus the Vancouver Canucks. I have a two-part answer to this. One, because it's Patrick Kane's 1,000 um, game ceremony. And I know that for the fans watching, I know he already had one, but they're honoring his wishes of wanting to do a ceremony with a packed stadium. So that will, or yeah. So that'll be really fun. I think those, um, those ceremonies are really, really, um, they, the Blackhawks do it so well and it's just fun to be a part of I think so that and also because it's Vancouver I mean I know that the rivalry between the Blackhawks and Vancouver is not what it was but it's still kind of a bitter rivalry you can see it when they play and I think the last time we faced them it was very um it was kind of goals galore between both teams and it was like pandemonium so I think that'll be actually really fun that'll be a fun game I think for both Patrick Kane and for the Blackhawks yeah, it's one of their more under-the-radar rivalries, but I, I personally love it too, Brooke, to be honest with you. I think that that's a great one, and I hope that they can uh, revive it when both these teams start to get a little bit better and, and perhaps meet in the playoffs once again. Greg, what game do you have circled first and foremost on this calendar? Um, I am looking forward to November 17th and the John Quinville revenge game at the Seattle Kraken. Um, we all remember Blackhawks legend John Quinville and everything he did here. Uh, but no, it's um, it's the first time the Hawks will play in Seattle. It's the first time the Blackhawks and the Kraken will ever play against each other. So that's always kind of fun and kind of neat. A little bit of an historic game. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of uh, 
Hawks fans out there that aren't as hardcore as others and probably won't, it'll be their first time seeing the crack and play. You know, they probably won't spend a lot of times late night watching Seattle games for that first month of the season. So <laughs> it'll give fans a, a, a good chance to see their new arena, which is supposed to be really cool and, and echo friendly and all kinds of fun, neat stuff out there. Get to see those, those fancy new uniforms they have maybe, um, you know, we recall players that are now in Seattle like oh yeah I forgot that they took him or they signed him so um you know it'd be a fun night something different a unique experience you know something new and then and, and I think that's always something that draws attention to people new new players new teams new uniforms uh so I'm looking forward to that should be a fun game yeah, it's a great word. It's always fun to see something, uh, something new and with an expansion. Mm-hmm. And, and what can, you know, how can this proven storied franchise welcome the new kids to town while still maintaining their place as uh, one of the league's elite, you know, welcome them in, but uh, throw them around a little bit. So it'll be fun to see what they can do with Seattle. And uh, interestingly, when I wrote this particular piece, speaking back to their last expansion year, uh, the NHLs, that is, the Hawks didn't beat Vegas once that entire year. They played three times and they went 0-3. So to me, there's a little bit of redemption in that respect where, again, as one of the more storied franchises in the league, they can't have that happen again where uh, an expansion runs all over them. And, and speaking of Vegas, to me, I, I'm looking straight at January 8th. Not only is that going to be the first time that Marc-Andre Fleury gets to see his Vegas, Vegas Golden Knights, excuse me, former Vegas Golden Knights, but he's actually playing in Vegas. I don't know how you can write this up any better that we all saw how messy that trade situation was in the off season. Uh, frankly, we've all seen in my opinion, and I think we can agree how mistreated flurry has been throughout his tenure in the NHL, both for Pittsburgh and Vegas for one of the most uh, story goalies since he's been in the league for two decades. Now, all this guy's done is, is win. He's had a smile on his face the whole time. He's done his part. He's played his role. And he just continues to succeed and he gets tossed around like he is washed up and can't do it anymore. Comes back and does it again and does it even better. Finally, wins a Vesna, finally recognized the way he should be and then gets thrown out yet again. <laughs> Luckily, the, the Blackhawks caught him this time and, and I can't wait to see a little bit of revenge come out of this guy because that smile is going gonna, is gonna to really... Uh, you know, turn into anything but when he gets on that ice. And, and you can mark my words there. When he's going to get to go head-to-head with Robin Leonard, who his former Vegas School of the Knights clearly prioritized over him for whatever reason I'll never understand. <laughs> he's going to finally get a chance to prove that he is the better of the two. He is where he now needs to be. And he is going to be part of the impact that the Chicago Blackhawks need to not only become a better team, but to supersede the teams like Vegas who need to have a uh, peg knocked out of their egos because uh, it's it, enough already. And Flurry's going to be the guy to do it for us. So I'm really looking forward to what he can do against his former team. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my oh my God. Oh my God. Is it January 8th yet? You got me so excited. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I could see a guy like Pete DeBoer, though, being a jerk and not starting Leonard that night and putting the backup in, you know, oh, and then, oh, and then right. say something and then say something like, I didn't want to take away from Mark Andre's big night. You know, sad Phil Collins is a little weird like that. So, you know what? You're, you're not wrong. And if anything, if he does that, then to me, that's just more of an ego boost for Flurry. Because if you don't even want to let him face off against Leonard and really prove it, then what does that say about your squad in the first place? So that's fine. Play your backup. I don't care. Flurry's going to still get the win, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. We'll, be- have to, we'll, we'll have to check the Vegas schedule, see if that's like the second night of a back to back or something where he may get a little goofy on us. <laughs> you're definitely not wrong. Either way, it means Flurry's back in town and, and he'll make everyone in that stadium regret ever overlooking what he can do. Oh, love it. And on that note, as we all look ahead to what we are looking forward to most throughout the season, that will do it for another episode of Blackhawks Banter. Thank you to Greg, Brooke, and Gail for joining me. And a special shout out to all of you for watching, listening, and engaging on all things Blackhawks. Until next time, take care, folks.